a good start now. Okay, my producer failed. <laughs> so nervous system changes, the brain starts deteriorating, right? It'll get smaller, okay? The neurons start, I don't wanna say disintegrating, but um, they start dying off and not getting replaced, okay? And then their sensory organs start going too, right? So their hearing, their touch, their taste, their smell, all right, all that stuff starts to disappear. Okay, so we have to take our time, right? When we're dealing with each individual case, find out what's going on. All right, what else happens? Okay, um, right, they start cataracts set in, glaucoma sets in, okay, all those different things. Um, a lot of people, my grandfather's one of them, he has to use the artificial tears every day, right? Because his tear ducts don't produce uh, fluid anymore, right? So we got to watch out. There's a whole lot of different different things we got to do. They get colorblind, right? They can't see at night. Um, they may not be able to see up close, okay? All these different things. So they tell you they're blind, right? What do we have to do? How would you treat a blind person? What, what might what might you change about your your practice if you were dealing with a blind person, Lucy? Right, be a lot more vocal, be a lot more descriptive of what you're doing, right, Lara? That's it, right? So we're not just going to go to pick them up, right? We're going to explain literally everything we're doing. Okay, they probably can hear where you are in the room, what you're doing. Okay, they may have more questions. It may take you a little bit longer to get them out. All right, but keep them comfortable, right? Make sure that they understand what you're doing, how you're doing it, and don't just go ahead and start doing things, right? So now hearing, okay? So again, the inner ear, right, does our balance, okay? So when they start having problems with the ear, they fall. I think we're about to have one over at Livingston Hills who's gonna be two, three times a day that she's gonna fall and we're gonna have to take her to the hospital. All right, but. We also have hearing loss, okay? Hearing aids don't always work, all right? Sometimes they don't have them in and they don't know where they are, okay? So what are we gonna do about people for hearing? How do we change up our, how do we change up our, our strategy for them? Hmm? Right, we can write stuff down, okay? We can communicate on paper, what else? We could maybe speak a little bit like slower. More clearly. gestures, right? Gestures, slower, clear. Okay. What do we have? What do we have with the problem with the masks? A lot of people read lips, right? A lot of people who are deaf taught themselves how to read lips. Okay. So, you know, the other night I was like, talk to them, put it back up. Okay. Made sure I was far enough away that I was comfortable but, and that they were comfortable. Okay, so, and then we get him to the hospital and he was the sweetest old guy. And I don't think he needed to go to the hospital at all, but because he had a history of um, brain bleeds and brain cancer, and he woke up that morning with a headache and then they were like, nope, he needs a CT, he's gotta go. I was like, all right, cool, whatever. So, but he had his hearing aid in, but he was still hard of hearing. And he had trained himself over 60 years to um, read lips, right? Cause he had had a hearing issue, I think his whole life. So I kept having to, and then when the nurse was talking to him in the hospital, I'm like, you're going to have to take your thing down. Cause he wouldn't answer her at all. And she'd be looking right at him. And then she would go like this and he'd be like, Oh, and like start talking to her. So sometimes we have to just readjust our strategies, right? Okay. Taste. All right. We damage our taste buds. They're gone. All right. That's why smokers don't really taste anything. You burn your tongue. Okay, that little part of your tongue kind of doesn't, doesn't really work anymore, right? Tongue has five different set zones that all deal with flavors, all right? So again, eating, old people don't like to eat, unless you're my grandfather, that man will, I have never seen, never seen a nine-year-old person eat so much. He will, Thanksgiving time, he, this towel, plate this big, and he'll eat two of them, and he will eat all of it. 
right? So I don't have to worry about him ever. But you'll see a lot of emaciated, anemic, right? Older people. Um, you can see the bone, right? The skin is right on the bone, okay? Um, might be malnourished, okay? You might see a whole bottle, a lot of insurers that the family tries to make sure they're at least getting something, all right? And then also tired, again, because they're not eating, not drinking, right? And then touch, okay? So especially people that have neuropathy and things like that, their pain perception may be gone. All right, so they may not even know they're hurt. I told you, told you about the one lady in Copake, right? The one lady with MS that we used to go to all the time. She always fell from her bed. One night she broke her ankle, okay? Had to be one, two o'clock in the morning. We were at that house six, seven times a day. Nobody, we all loved her. She was a sweet old lady, but nobody wanted to deal with her, right? It was always just pick her up, put her back in her wheelchair, pick her up, throw her back in bed, go about your day. All right, well, she broke her ankle one night. They picked her up. They didn't do any assessments. They put her back in her bed. She's like, no, I'm good. I don't care. Like, you know, I just want to go back to sleep. She signed. They went home. Next day, somebody found her unconscious in bed, right? She was septic from a broken ankle, okay? But she never felt it. She had no clue. And the other crew literally, because she was a regular, just dismissed that, you know, threw her in bed. She said she was fine. Didn't look at anything, all right? They kind of, they kind of got in some trouble. It was bruised. It was bruised pretty good. It was swollen. I mean, I don't know how much of that swollen and bruising, because I got her, I was there for the broken ankle. And I was like, when did you do this? She was like, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I was like, this is not new. Like, you've, you've been in bed all night. She's like, yeah, I just woke up and I couldn't move my leg. And I was like, I know why, right? Like, so, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it looked like that night. But I mean, you should have at least glance, right? We don't just pick people up, call it a day and walk out, right? Liability, okay? So, but, right, she had no clue. She didn't feel pain anymore, okay? So, along with neurologic deficits, right, come loss of mental faculties, okay? This being one of the worst ones, all right? So, dementia, it's unfortunate, all right? I think a lot of people are being misdiagnosed with it um these days uh, i think a lot of it might just be the way they're treated and their reaction versus dementia um however it does take away your cognitive abilities your social skills and your psychomotor abilities right so you kind of start regressing backwards um you're kind of reacting to events that aren't happening right there was one lady Yesterday, she thought she was being abused in the nursing home and she was like trying to run down the hallway, like away from people. And there was like no one near, no one touching her. And she's just screaming as she's walking down the hallway. And they're like, oh yeah, that's that's June, whatever. Like she does that and it's noon. It's about when she starts doing this, right? And she just, they just let her do her thing and make sure she doesn't fall and hurt herself, right? So it's, it's unfortunate and it, it happens. So you have to kind of, be able to redirect them all right they may ask you the same question 100 times okay or they may understand you one second and then the next second right they're gonna completely forget what you just said and then you're gonna have to go through the whole thing all over again and be like why am i why are we, what who are you what are we doing right that kind of stuff so these people take a lot of patience all right so alzheimer's is the other one Okay, Alzheimer's is that genetic right, loss of cognitive ability where they basically just forget everything and everyone around them and they keep going backwards until, until they're, they're gone, right? Parkinson's um, takes away your motor abilities, right? It's a, neuro, it's a neurologic disease with ticks and tremors. All right, makes it kind of hard to, to move around and stuff. Um, some days are better than others, 
Okay, CVAs, cerebrovascular accidents, right? Those are like your strokes, your TIAs, all right? But they can leave lasting scar damage that have resulting uh, neurologic deficits, okay? And then just random genetic factors that can happen. All right, so <clears throat> again, I think I've hit most of these, okay? Um, but while you're assessing them, you may run into a bunch of these factors all at once. And again, it's all about patience. All right, you just have to be calm, be, be more sympathetic, all right? And then just kind of walk them through things. They'll let you do stuff if you walk them through it, all right? They're usually pretty, pretty okay, all right? Especially if you validate kind of their feelings and their, their stuff. Um, I watched the video the other day and I wish, I wish I would have saved it so I could show you, but it's a lady showing you the difference, like a, a mother and a daughter. And she comes out, all right? And the mother wants to go home, but she's at home, okay? But she doesn't realize it's her home. She's having one of her bad moments and she wants to go. She wants to go in the car. She wants to go home and she wants her daughter to take her home, right? She comes out and she goes, stop being a dummy. You know, you live here, get back in the house. And the woman gets irate and they start fighting, okay? Right, that's not the way you deal with it. All right, when we take our first break, if I can find it, I'll play it because it's a really good video. Um, the second time she comes out and the mom's like, I want to go, I want to go home. And she's like, all right, mom, well, I have breakfast cooking. Can you come inside and have breakfast with me? She's like, well, I'm not hungry. I just want to go. And she's like, okay, but I'm hungry. Can you come have breakfast with me? Right, and at least sit down. And when I'm done breakfast, we'll go, we'll go. And she's like, okay, you'll take me home. I go, yeah, we'll go. All right, so she goes back inside. Right, and she she agreed to go back inside. She wasn't forced, she didn't have to drag her, pull her back in, right? And then, but you're validating like, we'll go, just come back in with me for a couple minutes, All right? Because in 20 minutes, she may not want to go home anymore, right? She may be different, okay? So it's give and take. You have to kind of let them be in control while also steering them in that direction that you want them to be in, okay? So delirium, right, is just, any sudden mental status change, all right, with the inability to focus or think logically, all right, and this is why we have the protocols for the excited delirium where they get a little crazy, all right. So again, it's more in hospitalized people than you will see it at home, all right, and anxiety may be, may be a part of it. Um, I had the lady last night in Hudson, uh, she was, playing with her guinea pig on the floor and then all of a sudden couldn't get up from the floor. And again, she was probably Isabel size at like 92 years old and like, but like skinnier, right? She was, everything was bone. Um, oh and she was just stuck on the floor. So we lift her up and she, we put her in the chair and all of a sudden she's like, I, I, I gotta, I gotta throw up. I gotta, I gotta throw up. And we're like, uh, okay, did you hit your head like on the floor? Like, we're all like worried about it. My daughter's like, no, she just gets really anxious and she has these episodes and like she gets it in her head and then she just starts, she gets excited and she throws up. And she did, she threw up twice and she felt better. And then she got up and like walked off in the living room and ignored us. It's like, all right, all right cool, whatever, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> you know, so I'm not gonna say it was delirium, but that anxiety was definitely there, okay? Um, who knows? I don't know what her, what her issue was. I mean, she was medically fine. There was no injuries. Her vitals were all good. So we left her with her daughter. All right. Um, withdrawal will definitely cause delirium. Okay. Certain medical conditions, depression has been known. All right. Malnutrition again, because your body's not getting everything. All right. So that can cause um, some delirium or your environmental abilities right if it's hot cold okay what we're really looking for is the causes right is hypoxia hypovolemia right which is what low blood volume right so are we looking for like a shock type scenario okay hypoglycemia or hypothermia right and you may see a whole bunch of different physiologic changes all right depending on what the root cause of the delirium is okay so just be aware of it. Again, it's not a, not a major function. Okay, syncope is probably the second most common um, call we get for older people. 
okay? So as long as it's a short syncope, okay, it's usually not too bad, all right? But if it is a, if they're been down and they're not getting up for a while, right, then we assume it's life-threatening until otherwise proven, right? Because we have no idea why they're unconscious or why they were alert and oriented then weren't, right? So possible causes, dysrhythmias, heart attacks, volume changes, all right, medications. Again, a lot of times with the polypharmacy, they think they took two different pills and they actually took two of the same pills, right? Because they all look the same. So you kind of got to gotta be careful there. All right. And then neurologic, whether it's TIAs or an actual stroke or whatever that problem is, right? But we don't just kind of poo-poo fainting, all right? We kind of take it seriously until proven otherwise, right? And it falls under the same things. Hypoxia, hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, right? Positive hypothermia, right? Neuropathy, I've been talking about a couple times here and there, right? It's basically a misfiring or disorder of the nerve endings in your hands and your feet, right? It's often very painful, okay? They have medication for it, all right? So their symptoms obviously are gonna depend on what nerves are affected and where, okay? So usually they'll be able to tell you that they're, they have neuropathy or that um, they're on like pain medication for neuropathy, okay? Um, and then you just have to be careful with whatever, whatever extremity, I guess, is affected, right? Because it is, sometimes you don't even want to touch it. You're like, all right, you, you, like, I'll hold behind your knee and move your leg, okay? Or, like, don't touch my arm, don't touch my shoulder, okay, whatever, right? Because we don't want to cause them any additional pain, all right? So just be more, more cognizant of where the pain is, all right, and help them out as the best you can. Okay, so GI problems, all right, they don't produce as much saliva, okay, whether or not they're taking care of their teeth, they fall out, dentures, right, whatever reasons, okay, but um, there's less stomach acid, right, less bile, less pancreatic juices, all right, all that stuff slows down, okay, there's more blockages due to the decrease of gastric motility, right? You may see more um, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, right? Bowel obstructions, um, all that kind of stuff. Any type of bowel disease, a lot of GIs or GI bleeds are in older people, um, okay? And then overall blood flow declines, right? So <clears throat> I literally just talked about all that. GI bleeds, okay. Um, most oftentimes it's through the coffee ground emesis, all right? Not every GI bleed is that I have to poop waterfall GI bleed that I talk about all the time, all right? That's usually your worst case, like active right now bleeding, all right? Most oftentimes, they're gonna talk about the red tarry stools or the Molina, okay? Or they might have like gray, greasy type of stools, all right? Um, one guy I almost had to leave his house. He apparently scooped it out of the toilet and had it in a stainless steel bowl and was like, this, and I was like, you can put that down, sir. Just, I believe you, okay? like. People do weird things, all right? <laughs> um, sometimes if I don't believe them, I will kind of go, right? Because hemorrhoids, all right? People put the toilet paper down there, they see blood, they freak out, all right? So sometimes if their vitals are perfectly stable, all right, they're not diaphoretic, they're not shocky, they don't, it doesn't look like they've been losing blood, okay? I will try to go look just to see, or I'll ask like, was it soaked or did, was it just a couple spots? right? Do you have hemorrhoids? All right. So I'm not saying every GI bleed is a hemorrhoid, all right? But just realize that that's a thing. But some people freak out because it's, you know, you shouldn't be bleeding from there. Right. So, and then obviously, depending on the severity of the GI bleed, right? We're going to look for shock-like symptoms. 
Okay. Um, right. So we talked about diverticulitis. Uh, you can have ulcers anywhere from the esophagus all the way down through the stomach, right? That can cause GI bleeds. Um, what else? What about the people who drink too much? What are they called? What's that? What's the problem? What do alcoholics get in their esophagus? The esophageal varices, right? Okay, they're kind of little blebs in the esophagus, all right, that when irritated will bleed and they'll just start vomiting, usually large amounts of blood, okay? They are uh, not, not sitting around to wait time calls, okay? Peptic ulcers, right? We talked about gallbladder disease, okay? Can cause problems and we talked about bowel obstructions. All right, so why do we, why do we worry about NSAID and alcohol? Mm -hmm. So some will eat away at the stomach of the lining. What else? What is the acetaminophen effect? Where is that taken out of? What uh, what filters that out? Okay. So what does alcohol affect? Okay. What does ibuprofen affect? Kidneys, right? So we were getting on a roll. Okay. <laughs> two two out of three are liver, right? <laughs> Then it's not all of the liver. I mean, the liver, I think, takes probably some of the ibuprofen out, but it's not the main part of it. Okay, so, right, we want to know what they're taking. All right, are they taking too much ibuprofen? Right, I will always swap. I go back and forth between Tylenol and ibuprofen because I'm not trying to shut my kidneys down and I'm not trying to shut, right, my liver down. Okay, I did enough drinking in my teenage years that I'm probably good on that whole cirrhosis thing in a couple of years. I'm trying to let it re rejuvenate itself some, um, right? So I'm trying not to do any more damage, okay? But again, now that I'm getting arthritis um, in my hip and my back, right? So Mark, what's the therapeutic dose of ibuprofen? 800 milligrams, right? So that's four, four of the little tablets, okay? I'm not gonna say sometimes I take five, <laughs> all right? Depending on how much, how much it hurts that day, okay? Right, yeah, the loading dose, because I haven't taken it in a couple of days, right? So I'm, you know, I'm trying to go back and forth, but we have to worry about that, especially if they're having abdominal pain, right? Which one could it be? Okay, maybe I took five straight days of a thousand of ibuprofen, and now I have back pain back here, right? So, okay, orthostatics. What's orthostatics? Okay, so when you, how do we fix, how do we test for that? Okay, which order would you do it in? Okay, sitting first and then standing, right? So again, this is gonna let us know if there's something wrong inside, like a volume problem, all right? You know how people suddenly stand up and they get dizzy? Okay, this is, one of them is this thing. Some people just have benign orthostatic hypertension. It's a thing, they have it. Okay, other times it could be more serious. All right, and as usually with abdominal problems, it's ABCs, right? Treat for shock, treat your presenting problems. Okay, and you guys know pretty much everything you need to know at this point. All right, we're just reinforcing stuff right now. Okay, again, the abdominal cavity is large. It's got a lot of things going on in it, all right, without... CT, X-ray, um, ultrasound. That was my little ultrasound, right? Spinning around on the abdomen is my little ultrasound kind of remind me of what it, what the word is, right? Without those kind of tools, we really don't know, right? We have no idea, all right? That's why we always say that abdominal should be ALS because it could be this, right? Or it could be an upset stomach, right? But how do we how do we know? Okay. So again, the worst thing we're worried about is blood loss. Okay. And then the abdominal aortic aneurysm is the, is the, the culprit for that one. All right. So let's go to the kidneys now, right? What happens in the kidneys? Same thing that happens everywhere else, right? Reduce blood flow, 
okay, which means reduced uh, efficiency. Okay, so the kidneys shut down. What happens when the kidneys shut down? Or start shutting down or start being less effective? Uh, eventually sepsis, but what's the first? What's the first thing that might happen? Right, there might be some water retention, okay? Because that stuff's not gonna get filtered out, right? So, okay, what are we gonna do for them? Like, we're not gonna do anything, but. Right, so these people might be on like Lasix, furosemide, water pills, right? They may say, I have a water pill, all right? It's in order to facilitate getting that liquid out, all right? Whether, okay, so medications can always kind of help give you an idea of what's going on with the patient, if, especially if they're unconscious, right? Knowing what affects what will let you know what this person is dealing with, especially in the elderly. All right, so decreased bladder capacity. So my grandfather won't go out on the boat anymore. Okay, he refuses to go out fishing with my parents on their boat because he's afraid he'll have to go to the bathroom. And of course, being from the 40s and 50s generation, he refuses to use the bathroom on the boat in front of my mother. If it was me, him and my father out there, he has no problem. He refuses to go out with my mother and use the bathroom. So he will sit outside in Maryland on the boat in a 100 degree day wearing a jacket because he's high risk for melanoma. All right, so my mom makes him wear a full windbreaker with gloves, all right? And he will literally dehydrate himself to go fishing and refuse to drink on the boat for like three hours. And then we get him home and literally we like just keep handing him water bottles and like just, yeah, it's a pain in the butt, okay? But because of his frequency, He's just, he refuses, okay? There can also be declines in, in muscle controls. Sometimes, right, you may not even know you have to go anymore. That whole system is gone, all right? So that's why they make the adult diapers, all right? A lot of times we end up having to go more during the night, right? You start make, get waking up all night long going to pee, all right? And then the old, for men, the benign prostatic hypertrophy, right? So your prostate is right behind your bladder slash urethra. Okay, when that starts to grow, starts causing pressure, right? Kind of gives you that urge that you have to pee all the time. All right, so that can cause problems. Okay, so just be aware of these things. All right, usually incontinence is not a normal thing. All right, and if they're not cleaning themselves or changing their diapers, all right, or if they're in a nursing home and they're not coming around and changing them or cleaning them appropriately, okay, we have to worry about skin irritation, skin breakdowns, most oftentimes in women, UTIs, okay, they'll have a long history of them, all right, especially if they're wearing the diapers, all right, sometimes they have that whole little stress incontinence things, pregnant women, all right, will often sneeze or cough and be like, oops, all right, and they'll tinkle themselves a little bit, and that's just because of all the functions and things that have moved around and happened. All right, they just lose control. Okay, you can only control like certain muscles at a time. It's kind of weird. All right, and then you have that urge thing, right? How many people walk in and turn the faucet on to pee? Is there anybody in this class? I had one in the last one. No, no one, no one that's going to admit to it. Okay, no, that's fine. I don't care if you do or you don't. There are certain people who, when they walk into the bathroom, have to turn the faucet on to hear that running water and somehow that running water urges them to urinate, right? Anybody ever do the little waterfall trick, right? Talk to you like when you're in the car and you have to go to the bathroom, they're like, running waterfalls, babbling brooks, right? No, you guys are nice to each other. Anybody put their friend's thumb in a paper cup of water when they were the first one to pass out of the sleepover? Yes, there you go, okay? That's the same kind of concept. All right, finally, something. You guys had me a little concerned that like no one has fun anymore as kids. I used to be the first, we all used to stay up as long as possible. You did not want to be the first one to pass out. Nope. So, all right. And then the opposite of incontinence is obviously retention. Okay. Um, again, the enlargement can make it harder to go, but makes you want to go more. 
right? So you got to watch out for bladder and UTIs. All right. And then sometimes it can lead to backup and in, into renal failure, right? So again, most of this is kind of just review slash good to know stuff, right? Um, the endocrine system, we're not really going to talk about. Is there anything we have to talk about here? Oh, other than diabetes and hyperglycemia. Okay. Just be, just be aware, right? If they're acting weird, check their sugars. Okay. Um, HHNS, again, is a type of diabetic complication. All right. It's going to show up pretty much exactly the same way as like a regular diabetic attack, right? Right before they go into like a coma. Okay, so they may warm flush skin, they may seem dehydrated, All right? They may look shocky, okay? Just treat them all the same way, right? There's no, no difference until you start ruling things out, right? right? Treat for shock, treat for sugars, okay? This one, I don't think you can, this one needs fluids. So this is a trip to the hospital, right? And then assessment is everything, right? What do we do? It's our general assessment, right? Nothing changes, okay? All right, immune system changes, okay? Again, your immune system drops as you get older, right? So they're less able to fight infections, right? Which is why we worry about not taking things to grandma or grandpa, okay? That's why everyone's been sitting at home recently, right? So a lot of them may be anorexic fatigue, weight loss, all right? All that puts stress on your body and decreases your immune response, okay? So that's why we try to stay as healthy as we can, especially in the medical field, right? Because we're bombarded with infectious stuff every day, okay? Why is pneumonia and UTIs common in bedridden patients? Anybody other than him today? He's good, he's got it, but he's not giving anybody a chance. Go take a break for five minutes. Anybody else? Anybody in my, in my headset? Why is, why is pneumonia in a bedridden patient? What is pneumonia? Miss Isabel, what is pneumonia? Okay. What is the cause of pneumonia? What? Okay, but what happens? What's the reaction? Right, what's the right, what's the physiologic reaction inside the lungs? Yep. Why? Build up a fluid, right? Okay. So now why is that in bedridden people? Why do you think that's more common? Good. All right. It's so now UTIs. Let's walk ourselves through a UTI. Why is a UTI common in a bedridden patient? Right, so you're possibly in a diaper, okay? Possibly even in your own underwear, whatever. But you're urinating, if you're not getting out of bed and you're urinating yourself and you're sitting in it, right? All of that toxins is still right there and that's a perfect environment, right? You've now created a warm, damp environment for bacteria to grow in and it's gonna, it's gonna move, right? So, perfect, all right. All right, so you guys got it. Okay, musculoskeletal system, right? What's What happens when you get old for your muscles and your bones? Huh? Osteoporosis, right? The bones become softer, more brittle. Okay, what else? What happens to your muscle tone? 
unless everything. you're unless you're the lumberjack grandpa that keeps going to the gym every every week right that one guy on tv that you see like look like me at 65 and they're trying to sell some kind of nutritional pill right but unless you're that guy what else happens the mass of both and like the tone of both of them are just decreasing right your muscle mass your muscle tone okay what about what about your joints what happens to all that cartilage does it go away or do you wear it out right would it be the same i mean it would be the same right does it go away or do you wear it out the cartilage like in your like in your knees and your elbows more like a wearing out right it doesn't just hype or hypotrophy and disappear right it just kind of wears out eventually yeah i got one they thought my my one knee my left one you can actually feel it is almost completely gone from being a catcher as a kid the cartilage is like flat like and they're they're completely different the guy's like how old are you and i was like 40 and he's like are you sure i'm like pretty sure <laughs> he's like what did you do I'm like yeah well Right, but it is what it is. I had fun. That's all that matters. Okay, so what are the two things? I don't know if I've mentioned it, but what are two things that you think the elderly are most concerned about? Huh? Falling, which is what? What are they most afraid of losing? Huh? Their independence. And what's the other one? Now, well, maybe their memory, but what goes along with their independence? Now, what's the first way to lose your independence? All right? Okay, their mobility. All right. They don't, they refuse to walk with a cane. They refuse to walk with a wheelchair or use the walker. All right. Because they don't want to go away. Okay. So they're stubborn. All right. Like they're going to try like hell. That's why they fall all the time. All right, because they're stubborn and they don't want to use the cane or they're using the cane and they're not confident with it and they feel weak and shaky because they should be in a four, you know, prong cane instead of like the one arm cane. All right. Or the walker. All right. So we got to kind of got to work in between. Right. So we talked about how the muscle becomes smaller. All right. Your strength declines. All right. Your cartilage degenerates. Okay. Your ligaments lose their elasticity, right? So the, everything doesn't snap back into place the way it's supposed to, all right? It's a lot harder and stiffer to move your joints, okay? And your overall neurons are decreasing. So you can't, you don't have the same amount of receptors to tell your arm to move that you used to, all right? So then that's why it makes it harder, okay? We talked about osteoporosis, okay? Now the extent of the bone loss, right? Depends on your overall genetics, all right, your overall body weight, okay, your bad habits, all right, as I reach for mine, and again, that activity and diet, all right, huh, is it alcohol, I wish, Duncan made Irish coffee, I'd be, I'd be there every day, <laughs> I felt bad yesterday, so supervisor stopped by the station, and there was a beer in the trash can, He's like, what are you guys doing? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, why is there beer in the trash? I was like, um, because we're having beer, bacon, and cheese, sloppy joes for dinner, right? So I, I was making sloppy joes in the crock pot, and I, I put beer in mine. So, but he was like, are you sure that's all you did? And I was like, do you want to smell my breath? But yeah, so funny side story. All right, and then we have the arthritis, okay? That's the one that destroys the cartilage, right? It eats it away. All right. So it could be a little bit of both. All right. Usually from wear and tear, usually in the, all in your joints. Usually these ones go first. All right. Unless you're funny, fun, and you have that ankylosing spondylitis like I do, where your hips and your back go first. Makes for good times. Although now that I have my Moderna nanobots, I have not been... I've not had to take Tylenol, ibuprofen, my muscle relaxers, or been on the chiropractor since I had my COVID shot in September. So I'm not going to say that there's nanobots in the COVID vaccine, but there may be nanobots in the COVID vaccine because I could barely walk 
like before then. I'd have to get up, pace around the room a little bit, sit back down for 10 minutes, get real stiff and sore, get up, pace. I was every week going to the chiropractor to get readjusted just to sit in an ambulance to do my job. And now I'm good. So I don't know what happened, but I'll take it. Okay. And then skin, right? We all, we all love that old person, real thin, flaky, almost translucent kind of skin. Okay. Real soft tears real easily. You can sometimes just like grabbing on and like pushing your finger across it. will like your skin will slough right off sometimes. Okay. So just be more careful. Again, they're not exactly getting all the nutrients they eat, they need, right, to keep their skin pliable, right? The, la the fat layers become much thinner. Like I said, sometimes it's just skin and bone, right? There's no muscle, there's no fat to it, all right? A lot of times we see the bruising, right? We see all the pink and purple, all the different discolorations. What else can cause that? Blood thinners, yeah. What else? Is Zoom still working or did someone just mute themselves? Because it got real quiet. Oh, apparently it's still working. He just must have muted himself. The background, like, where, why I couldn't hear you before is gone now. All right. <clears throat> and then the sweat glands don't respond properly. Okay. So they retain their, their heat a little bit better. They're not able to thermoregulate. Okay. Pressure ulcers. What's a pressure ulcer? It's a bed sore, right? What kind of, hmm? See, I can't even do that and I don't wanna do that. All right, we'll do that in a couple minutes. I'll show you the different stages. All right, there's four stages of pressure ulcers. All right, stage one is not so bad. You can, you can get away with it. Stage two, all right, if you go to wound carry, somewhat will heal. Once they get to stage three, they're usually, that's it. Stage four is a complete, necrotizing uh, it's not necrotizing fasciitis but it's a complete like they go in and scrape out way more than they take in order to get the infection out of there and i had one lady we used to take to wound care and she had she's the only woman i've ever transported on her stomach because from like her whole right glute was gone you could literally see like her pelvis you could see the vasculature, like when they took the bandage off, you could literally see like the muscle was gone. You could, you could literally see everything, all the ligaments, strands, everything like in their whole left side here. It was just whatever pressure sore bacteria she got just ate through everything. And I was just like, how are you still alive with this? Like it was, uh, I'll show you pictures. Like you'll see, I'll, I'll find pictures when we take a break. <laughs> huh? I mean, I don't have pictures of her, but I will find you like a stage four pressure ulcer and I'll show you how bad they can get. I think hers was the worst I've ever seen. Okay, but, right, so stage one, there's a, there's a little bit of redness, all right? It almost just looks, I kind of want to say like psoriasis, all right? It's like a little red mark. It's got a little white line around it, okay? Um, and that's just about it. It's a little minor surface damage of the skin. Okay. No, we're fine. Stage two, all right, is when it starts to blister or ulcer. All right. It starts to open up a little bit, or you get that pressure blisters. Okay. And it may just be in the superficial layers. It may be a couple layers down. All right. Stage three is when it really starts to break, starts to open up, goes through the fat layer of the skin. All right. You're about a half inch deep at this point, depending on where it is. Usually they get them right here in their back, in their butts, right? Because we're talking about elderly people, usually in the nursing home, unfortunately, all right? Or people who are bedridden at home. Where else? Where's the other? If it's not here, where's the other, uh, other place they get them? Who can think? If you're bedridden, right? Who's looking at, who's looking at Mark right now? Mark's giving everybody the answer or was, right? Where else? The back of the heel, okay? A lot of times they'll be in soft padded booties, all right, to protect the back of their heels from the bed because they just sit there and rest, all right? They don't move, 
Okay. And then stage four, like I said, complete, complete invasion. All right. And we will find pictures so that you guys can see it. All right. And then toxicology and sepsis. All right. Older people are more susceptible to sepsis, right? Again, because of everything we've talked about. Okay. So again, just be careful, be aware. Polypharmacy, I know I've talked about a couple of times, right? So try to write them all down. They're going to hand you a garbage bag or two big gallon Ziploc bags, usually of medications. All right. Because 911 tells them to bag everything up and hand it to you when you get there. All right. Again, OTC stuff, you know, they may combine it. They may take too much. Some of the OTC stuff along with their prescription medications may have negative effects. All right. And they don't always know all of that contraindications to that. Okay. No polypharmacy. All right. You will see that on a test. I know you will. All right. So overdosing. All right. is not always intentional. Like I said, okay. So even if they overdose, don't be like, nah, 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 right. Just figure out what they took so that when they get to the hospital, they have an idea. All right. Don't yell at grandma because she took three blood pressure pills. All right. Just help her out. All right. Sometimes they can't afford them. Sometimes they can't get the jars open. Right. I love those little new pill pack things they have that have them all in one little pack. You pull one out, pull it open. Okay. If you still have the ability to tear it, all right. Instead of that child proof, sometimes they don't have the, the arthritic people can't. Right. So a family member or they have the 30 day calendar pill things, right. Where they sort them. Someone sorts them for them. They just open the top and they take the pills in the thing. All right. So and they might not be able to see. If you can't see the bottle, you don't know which one you're taking. You just grab a bottle. Someone messes up your system, right? It happens. Okay. So why are older people depressed? What, what are causes of depression in maybe older people? Loneliness? What else? Hmm. Okay, their loss of their mobility or their independence. What else? Hmm? The people around them are dying, right? They're losing all their friends. His? What else? Anyway. Yeah. What else? Maybe losing their homes. What? Losing their home. Right, their body deteriorating. Yep. So Carolina had a good one losing their house. Okay. What happens when you put someone in a nursing home? Does anybody know? Has anybody had to put a family member in a nursing home yet? Huh? It's terrible. But what happens when you put someone in a nursing home? Like if you put you put your mother or your father in a nursing home, what do you have to do? Well, you don't strip them of their rights, but what, what, do, what does a nursing home take? The nursing home will have you sign over their house as collateral to pay their bill. How many nursing homes own houses? It's ridiculous. All right. So like the first thing you do, if you're putting a family member in a house or in a nursing home is you have that person sign their house over to you. Right. So that if it ever happens, you don't lose your family house, like if you can't pay the bill, right? And nursing home bills are not cheap. It is a couple thousand dollars a day, right? Even for just rehab. So, okay. So, right. And all of that will lead, okay, to this. I can't tell you how many 55, 60 year old men in the last five years I've found who took a walk into the woods, all right? I, just that age range. I don't know why, okay? I obviously can't ask them, right? But something happened, okay? What about this one? No one said this one, okay? What about a poor diagnosis, right? What if they just got a death sentence, okay? Stage four cancer of some sort, right? Possibility. What about... What's a big one? We didn't say the big one. What's a real big one? He was close. John was close. Let's narrow it down a little bit. 
spousal loss, right? Okay, you've been married for 50 years, all of a sudden your husband or your wife dies, right? How are you feeling? That's kind of rough to get through the first, how long? How long do you think it takes you? Hmm? Sometimes there is the broken heart disease. Yep. Yep. So it happens, right? There's no rhyme or reason to it. Okay. Who knows? I, right? You just give up. I don't know how it works. I, I wouldn't even, I couldn't even begin to figure out the physiologic manifestation of giving up and just dying a day and a half later like how do you how how does that work <laughs> right like i don't i can't believe you have that ability on your own self to literally shut yourself down in a day and a half i don't know right so again older men why do we think older men Anybody? I don't have an answer. I'm just asking, why do we think older men? Maybe more pressure, more societal pressure. What else? This might be like a reach, but just with the generation, like does it have to do with like veterans and PTSD and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. Right, so older men may not have a social group, okay? Something to keep their time up, right? Keep themselves interested. I don't know who it was, but they just said veterans and PTSD, okay? Finally, it catches up to them maybe, right? That they don't have an outlet for it or, you know, maybe they do have a social group and now there was five of them and now there's two of them and, right? At their, their numbers are dwindling and, right? They just can't handle it anymore and whatever it is, okay? But for whatever reason, the older generation, all right, is more well, prevalent like, to commit suicide uh, than the younger ones. Job. Hmm, losing their job. At, you know, at an advanced age. <laughs> and not being yep. Another or maybe the inability to work. The inability like, to work, right? So that loss of a meaningful life role, okay? That might be one of them, right? Because I'm not gonna say society tells us our whole job is providing, but what is what society tell you a man's job is, right? or at least it used to be, okay, was to provide. Like our job is to go out, work, make sure that the next generation or our family is taken care of and provided for, all right? You take that away from somebody who lives their whole life doing that, what do they have left, right? Maybe they don't have hobbies, right? Hopefully they can go fishing, right? Hopefully they can go to knitting club, book club, whatever, whatever they wanna do, right? You know, who cares, okay? But you gotta have something when you're done, okay? My dad likes to travel, all right? They go, they've been, they did a cross country camping trip, took the camper, put it behind the truck. Then it took three months and drove around the country. He went to every state park he had never been to before he started working. And that was his, like one of his bucket list things he wanted to do. And it took my grandfather, my mom has video of my grandfather going up the mountains in Moab in a crawler, just the biggest smile on his face. And I'm like, God, oh, I want to do that, right? But so they had a good time, all right? So what do we do, all right? When we ask, why do we always ask? Why does the nursing home staff, or why does the nurses always ask, right? What are the questions they ask elderly people when they come in? You guys know, you've done it before. It's been a while, but what do they ask when you do your patient handoff? Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe at home? Okay, right? Do you have a plan? They always ask, like anyone that comes in with suicidal ideations, do you have a plan? All right, <clears throat> and if they say yes, well, they're gonna stay in the hospital for a couple of days, all right? Because some people have a plan, they may not act on it, right? But you may have an idea, you may have a plan of what you're gonna do, all right? So, and then just let them know, let them know, right? Sometimes you may see a note and they were getting in the process of doing it, all right? And a family member stopped by. I was talking to him earlier, I didn't get, get him to tell the story, I don't think it was a suicide attempt. Um, 
but this lady on Monday night, she stopped, she has an estranged relationship with her father and she stopped by her dad's house, never been inside. So she has no idea what the inside of the residence looks like. Um, stopped by around midnight cause he wasn't answering the phone all day and she heard snoring. So she was like, okay, he must be sleeping on the couch. Right. And there was a light on. So she assumed that was the TV and she went away. So she came back at about eight o'clock in the morning, tried calling again. Um, still wasn't answering the phone. So she got the landlord to meet her at the house to open the door, found him face first on the floor on some concrete, um, like in the garage type area of the house that doesn't really look like a garage, but who knows? I wasn't there long enough to, you know, really figure out what was going on. Right. So she's like, well, he's had two, both kidneys replaced and he used to be an alcoholic, but he doesn't drink anymore. And I immediately looked and there's like a handle of vodka, a handle of rum, a bottle of crown Royal and something else. And I was like, so whose is that? And she's like, what? And I go, the four bottles were right here. She's like, I didn't even see that. Well, he never drank hard liquor. And I was like, okay. It's like, he was always a Bud Light guy. Cool. Walk over to the fridge. There are two cases of Heineken and a case of Coors Light in there. And I was like, so is that normal? And she goes, uh, is he really drinking again? I was like, Why are you asking me? I don't know. <laughs> right? So we left, right? We, I, we were gone. And I took a sugar. Anybody want to guess what his blood sugar was? Take, take a while, I guess. Stab at it. Huh? Oh, he was unconscious. He was snoring. It was low. How low do you think it was? 30? Let's go lower. Let's play the high-low game. 30 is too high. 10, 10 is too low. Too high. 15 is one too low. It's 16. Yeah, it was 16. Okay. So I threw 250 mLs of glucose into him, got a sugar to 150. He is still out. Done. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you can help me with this or not. So he was posturing, but he was posturing and like moving like his shoulders. And then he would posture like, like this, but like his, his fists would still always be in and they were always clenched. And he was like posturing, but like, like moving while he, I like, I've never seen someone move so much postured. And I could, I was so no idea, no idea. Right. His, his pupils weren't blown. Like I so said, I don't think he hit his head when he fell. He didn't smell like alcohol. Like I didn't smell him drunk. And then I know his blood work was way off. He was hypothermic. It's, he was ice, ice cold. I was, I didn't, wasn't there long enough to get a core body temp for him. I would have loved to, but huh? I wasn't there long enough to hospital. I don't have a thermo I don't have a rectal thermometer in my ambulance. And I'm really not the Yeah, it's cold. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Is there way back? He knows what these are. Okay. This is a stage one. <clears throat> All right. This is that nice red, splotchy, glossy. Okay. Sometimes there will be a white ring around the outside. All right. This is someone's someone's rear end that's going to go in different stages. All right. This is stage two. Maybe. There it goes. All right. So stage two, see how it gets a little bit more involved. All right. It's kind of sunken. There's more white swelling pussy exchanges all right you got a little little bit of yellow pus there in the middle okay it's gonna be very sore very weepy all right very agitated all right so when we move these people we really have to be careful all right here's a stage three on the foot okay so for whatever reason the bottom of their foot has been up against something all right but you can start to see Muscle tissue in the bottom of the foot, right? It's completely broken and open. All right. This is stage four of a foot. Okay. Um, you can kind of see where it's starting to get into deeper in, right? You're starting to see some of that fascia layer inside the muscle. All right. It's all necrotic on the outside of it. Okay, and then watch this guy's knee. 
stage four of a knee. Okay. That's literally the structure of a knee. You can see the patella in there. You can see the bone in there, right? That's all, that's all an infection. How does that even happen? It's a bacterial infection from not being clean, from having laying on something, all right? That's probably one knee pressed against the other knee laying in like a fetal position for days on end, not being turned in the nursing home, whatever, not being turned at home if they're at home in a hospital bed. Right. It's all from laying on top of each other, right? Just that pressure. Oh, that's that's like that's that's a couple months. That's a month. That that's a problem. If it if it's at that stage, like that's more of the neglect and abuse, or it's just out of control, someone doesn't know how to handle it. Okay. Also comes from, and in the knee, I don't know. The ones here is either diaper, right? Cleaning the diaper, laying on the back, laying in the hospital bed, laying in a nursing home bed, laying in a bed at home, just, you know, not being able to be turned or whatever, for whatever reason, not being cleaned in a timely fashion. Um, so those are some instances of the, of the pressure ulcers. Um, where was the one? I wanted to show you the hip and I didn't, I erased it real quick. Pressure ulcer hip. This one. Oh, uh, was it this one? I think it was this one where we can actually start to see, see the hip bone itself, the pelvis, all the fascial fascial and muscular layers, right? This lady, where she's got them in multiple spots. If you look, you can even see the blood on the sheet down here where this one's starting, right in this area, right? And then these, this is just, this is what you see. If you do it long enough. This is what you see when you, when you go to nursing homes and sometimes like private residents. I've had one lady who goes to wound care to get cleaned up and you know she does all her stuff at the house. She's got daily, daily healthcare people there all the time. So, and I don't think they're always done maliciously or on purpose, right? Sometimes it's a lot of work, and sometimes it just it happens. Right. By stage four, I feel like you should have caught it by then. But the stage one, stage two, it can happen. All right. Usually wound care is pretty good about getting it back on track. Like I said, once you get that full open, right, that's usually, usually you have that for the rest of your life. All right. So we're going to talk about trauma real quick, and then we're going to talk about elder abuse, and we'll be done with, with old people. Why are we concerned about elderly people in trauma? They're fragile, right? What else? They don't recover as quickly. What else? Right, well, that's fragile. Hmm. They lose, they might not know they're as hurt as they are, right? What else? Medical issues that could um, affect um, the trauma. Right. Pre-existing medical conditions that may exacerbate the trauma. What's the other one? Right. They're fragile. They won't recover as quickly. Why? What physiologic change that we talked about happens with elderly people that we would be more concerned about? especially in a situation of like a shock-like situation, like if they were bleeding out, why, what, what are we concerned about? Hmm. Well, if they're on blood thinners, right? Obviously blood thinners we're concerned about, right? There's more prevalence of blood thinners, so they won't clot, all right? So they're gonna bleed faster, but what are, so 
okay, let's take that a step further. Now, now they're bleeding. It's harder to stop the bleed. What other physiologic change that we talked about makes it worse? What do they have? What's different? Volume, okay? They have less volume, right? So especially if they're anemic, right? Or something like that, they have less, less iron, less hemoglobin, right? So they're already perfusing less. Now they're going to be bleeding. They're not going to be able to clot because they're on blood thinners. They have less volume to bleed, so they're going to go into what faster? They're going to go into shock faster, okay? So, <clears throat> right, so now we got to worry. So what kind, of, what kind of traumas, right, do you think are most prevalent for older people? Falls, right, what else? Car accidents, okay. All right, so like we talked about, right? Recuperation is longer, okay? Many times, all right, especially I gave you my story about my one lady, all right? They're under triaged or under treated or under assessed, right? Because we deal with the same person repeatedly, all right? And every, we know how to handle them. So we go in, we do what we do every other time and we leave, all right? We miss something, right? We get complacent, okay? So we got to be a little bit more careful when we're assessing older people, right? Hopefully, we don't have too many people getting hit by cars, all right, Cross, crossing the crosswalk stuff. This is more like inner city stuff, all right? But again, when you get hit by a car, there's a lot more going on there, right? You got leg fractures, blood vessels, right? Why do we, why are there more injuries to the arms and legs? What's the most common leg injury in, in the older people? Hmm. Anybody? Hip dislocation, hip fractures, right? From falling. I can't hear you back there. I got one ear closed. Speak up. You got your masks on too, right? I get it, but I still can't hear that far. All right. What about the arms? What kind of arm, arm injuries, right? The reach outs, okay? The spiral fractures, the, the humerus fractures, okay? Maybe wrist fractures, right? From trying to catch themselves, okay? What's the secondary impact? What's the primary impact? Okay, so you fall, all right, you hit your hip. That's the primary impact. What happens after you fall and hit your hip? You hit your head, what's hitting your head? That's your secondary impact, right? Okay, so the, the, in, the, whatever happens after the initial contact, all right, whatever the cause of the trauma is, all right, that secondary cause, okay, can be possibly more, more serious or cause increased injury, all right, but we have to be careful of that, all right? Again, altered mental status, right? You got my one neighbor when I was a kid, her mom had Alzheimer's and she used to think she was in Brooklyn. So she would leave her house, walk through our yard, walk down our driveway, go in the corner store. That wasn't there. And if you didn't catch her by the end of the driveway, she would just walk out into the street because she thought she was on the sidewalk in her old neighborhood of Brooklyn. All right. So we had like the whole town was on the lookout for this lady. We all knew her. We all walked her back to her house. We're like, all right, come on. Like the store's this way. Let's go. And we walked her back. Right. And usually she would escape while her daughter was in the bathroom. <laughs> it was funny. It was like, you could always tell, but that's, that's what happens. Right. So just got to be careful. All right. So hopefully not too many older people are getting shot. All right. But again, there's more, more injury. All right. Mortality rates. Okay. From penetrating traumas. All right, falls, we talked about, they're one of the worst ones, okay? And it's all, always from hitting their head. That's why nursing homes, every one of them has a policy. Every time they fall, they have to go get either an x-ray or a CAT scan just to make sure nothing's going on, right? To cover themselves from liability, all right? So just remember, anytime they fall, they're complaining of head pain, neck pain, put them in a the collar, all right? Protect yourself. Don't, don't just be like, oh, well, you fell, it's okay. All right, we talked about all the other different changes. 
right? So we talked about the inability to compensate, right? Talked about the, the increased ability to go into shock faster. All right. Osteoporosis, again, we talked about and how it increases your possibility of broken bones, right? So again, look out for their history, right? And anything, right? It could be, it could be walking, walking down the stairs and you threw your hip out. And the guy, I told, I told you about the yoga guy, right? Where the doctor got mad at him. He was doing yoga, pulled his hip out. Okay. Fall from standing, right? Vitamin deficiencies, any of these things. Okay. It doesn't have to be like, we think of trauma. We think of, right. Car accidents, um, falling off a ladder. All right. Like bicycle accidents, right. Kind of normal, generic, like larger type things. Right. But like an everyday occurrence can be a traumatic incident for older people, okay? So spinal column becomes stiffer, right? The vertebrae become thinner, that cartilage in between decreases, right? So there's less um, absorption, right? So you can have compression fractures from a fall, all right? So there's a whole lot of things you gotta worry about. That's why the older, older people I usually like to take to the hospital just to be careful, all right? In case they're absolutely adamant against it, but, right? Head injuries, okay? Because there's more room in the cage to rattle around when they fall or because of that secondary injury or impact, right, from the original fall, okay? So, again, that's why we take them in to make sure they're not having head bleeds from that traumatic incident, right? So how are we gonna, well, how do we know if they're having a, a head bleed? Hmm. It can show in the vitals, right? How, I mean, what is, what is a, a subdural hematoma is going to show up just the same as what? Or possibly the same as what? It's one of, right? Huh? Not their vital signs. What, what else is, what have we talked about repeatedly, right? What will it act like? Right? It could show up like a stroke. Okay. It may be more subtle. All right, there may be one pupil might be more dilated than the other. All right, there might be bruising in one place. Okay, there might be a little weak on one side. All right, depending where that bleed is, where they struck their head, right? But just be aware of those tiny, those tiny changes. Okay, then of course, alcohol, alcoholism. We talked about the anticoagulants, right? So a lot of this we get through just by talking, right? So environment, your elderly people are more susceptible to hypo and hyperthermia, okay? So like I said, the guy we found on the ground overnight, he was ice cold, right, hypothermic, okay? So anybody unknown downtime or unknown on the ground, middle of summer, you can lay on your ground and still be hypothermic on your kitchen floor falling as grandma, okay? I've seen it, all right, so just be careful. All right. Like this one said, indoor, right? Indoor hypothermic deaths. Okay. Or indoor hypothermic activities. All right. It can happen inside. You don't have to be in the snow. Everybody good? Okay. And it may, it, most trauma, most traumas in geriatrics are not a single trauma. Right. So like if you're in a car accident and your femur is broken, right, it might just be your femur. Okay. If you're fall or something and you snap your leg, right, your leg. Okay. Old person falls, like they snap their leg, they might throw their hip out, they might hit their head, they might throw their shoulder out when they fall because they didn't catch themselves. Right. There may be multiple injuries involved. Okay. So just do a general broad assessment and then worry about your focus assessment afterwards. Okay. Nursing homes, my favorite. All right, I will try to be as unbiased during this next five minutes as possible. Okay, I don't want everyone walking into a nursing home going, you all suck. However, there are better ones than others. All right, there are, I've been in good ones, I've been in bad ones. Okay, and I, it's a lot of work. All right, there's a lot of patients, there's less staff. I understand it, I get it. All right, but 
sometimes. Okay. So I will say all the calls in a nursing home are challenging just because you're trying to differentiate between the patient's story and the staff story. And nine, five times out of 10, I'll be, I'll be generous. They don't, mit, they don't match. All right. So which one's right? Okay. So most people, all right, in nursing facilities themselves, like long-term nursing facilities are already chronically ill. So there's already something wrong and they're just being, it's just being exacerbated. All right. So not often or not all the time they alter, but they're often altered. Okay. Um, again, staff, especially nowadays, all right. The nurses are doing just as much hours as we are 16. The, my neighbor's a nurse and her car is gone just as often as mine is. She'll come home for six hours and go back. Right. It's just, it is what it is right now. She's a, I don't even know how they're doing this one. She's a, she's a LPN and she works the overnight shift as the RN in charge and hands out medications. And I'm like, hmm, I'd be careful. <laughs> like that seems like a liability issue, but all right. So that's how short staffed the one nursing home is, but it is what it is, right? So what do we want to know about nursing home patients? Right? We don't, I don't, I do want to know their entire life history, but I don't want to know that thick packet that they hand you that's this thick that gives like the 42 medications they're on and the 82 diagnoses they've had in their entire life because you stub your toe in a nursing home, you now have foot pain as part of your like nursing home diagnosis, they code everything. So you, you're like, your, your past medical history is a paragraph this long of like every little like sore throat, um, whatever, okay? So you gotta sift through it. I wanna know what's wrong today, all right? Why am I here today? What changed, okay? What's the difference, all right? Um, sepsis, infection, okay, is your number one usual prime target in nursing homes for altered mental status or fevers or sickness, okay? And again, it's just because you're already sick, you're coming home sick, back from the hospital, right? You're bringing back whatever the hospital gave you or whatever germs were in the hospital that you got back there. And it just, it gets spread around to everybody, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So just be careful. All right, always, always BSI and scene safe. All right, C. diff is a bacteria, usually in your fecal matter. All right, um, usually they'll tell you they're, they're positive, okay? And just be very careful what you touch, where you touch, wear gloves, all right? Especially if they're actively having diarrhea or an active case of the C. diff right now. All right, and again, most hand sanitizers don't kill it, okay? So make sure you don't touch it. Wash, 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 soap and, soap and hot water. All right, and of course, COVID, all right? During the original 2019 version of COVID, like we cannot say that since we're almost three years away from it, right? During the original COVID, um, the nursing homes were actually warding off certain floors of just and putting all the COVID people there so they didn't spread it to everybody. Now it's all back to gen pop and they just, it is what it is. If you got it, you got it. So hospitals used to do the same thing. I don't know if they still, I haven't been on the hospital floor in a while. I don't know if they still have the back corner set up um, as a quarantine area, but again, it's just whatever go, whatever comes into the nursing home goes through the nursing home. All right. So, it's just the way they work. Okay, so again, right, we, we have to worry about the elderly and dying, okay? So it's a very touchy subject. Um, a lot of people like to die at home, all right? So you may take someone home for palliative hospice care that, you know, has a couple of days left and they just wanna, wanna die at home in peace on the farm with their dog, whatever it is, okay? So, we don't do too much, all right? Most times I won't even take their vitals, especially if they're on palliative care. It doesn't matter at this point, right? So the only thing we're there for is... All right, everybody hear me again? Yeah. 
All right. All right. Okay. So again, as John was just saying, right, determine if the family wants the patient to go to the hospital or stay home, and then just respect their wishes the best you can. Right? Do right? Do what's asked of you the, to the best of your ability. All right. So who remembers the most form from like months ago? Right? That wonderful most form I gave you guys copies of the DNR, DNI forms, right? That have all those wonderful illicit instructions that all of a sudden you're like, well, this makes it not this and this what, right? Okay, so advanced directives, right? We've talked about, all right? So if they're there and if they're put in your hand and you see them and you hold them, right? Those are now your, your orders. That's what the person wants you to do. That's what we do, okay? There may be like a living will, maybe a DNR, maybe a most, maybe a physician order. Okay. So my wonderful thing that I tell everybody, right? DNR means do not treat. What is it? What is the actual, what does a DNR mean? Okay. What is resuscitation? What is the reason for CPR? Nope. Why do we do CPR? Like what happens? What is the physiologic change in your body that requires CPR to start? No pulse. Okay. What happens if you have a pulse? Okay. But so, right. Okay. So that DNR starts when? No, not when they stop breathing. When their heart stops, right? So we can do everything we can do. Okay. We're going to do this. We're going to treat up until that heart stops. All right. I will do everything I can unless the thing tells me on the back, like no IV, no medications, pain management only. Right. Then that's all I'm going to do. But if all that's checked on that form is DNR, DNI. Okay. I'm going to do everything I can to keep your heart beating without intubating you. Okay. Until it stops. When it stops, I stop. All right. That's my job. DNR does not mean, oh man, you're dying. It might take like 30 minutes or 45 minutes from now, but we're just going to watch you die to the hospital. Like that's, that's not what DNR means. Okay. Right. We're still doing our job. ABC, treat for shock, treat the presentation, whatever it is. Okay. Now, if they literally look at me and they look me in the eye and they'd be like, I don't want you to do a damn thing. All right. That's a different story. As long as they're alert and oriented when they tell me. I will stop doing what I'm doing. Okay. But DNR does not mean D do not treat. I cannot say that enough. I cannot stress that enough. All right. And then the physician order, this is what I was talking about before with the most. Okay. You may have a form with specific physician orders on it. Okay. And that's what that person and that doctor have decided is going to be their end of life treatment. And that is what we are responsible to take care of, okay? And then, like I said, if you do not have a piece of paper or something in your hand that says, do not resuscitate, right? And you get there, start it, right? It's worst case scenario, okay? If you find it later, then you can stop, all right? Or, right, but we don't know about whether the daughter wants grandma dead or not, so, okay? We don't just take someone's word for it, unless it's the patients. Like I said, if you're alert and oriented times four and we're going to the hospital and I don't have one and I say, what are your wishes if, if you were to, your heart to stop and they tell me, don't do anything, right? I'm not gonna do anything. That's my, my binding contract right there. All right, and I'm just gonna note it in my chart and we'll go about our business, okay? So leads into elder abuse, right? Neglect, okay? In the state of New York, we are not mandated reporters for the elderly all right so you can walk into a very rundown place and be very upset about and have an emotional response to how this old lady is living okay and you can call and it might take a month for them to do something about it all right they are not not super quick about worrying about the the elderly population okay 
kids, they'll be there in an hour. This one usually takes multiple, multiple calls, multiple reports. All right, because they try to find family who can come in and help them clean and come in and help them take care of themselves. They try to get state resources, people who can come in, help them do things, right? Because they don't want to take them away. They don't want to take their rights. They don't want to have to be wards of the state. Okay, so. I mean, you have to be certain that there's some sort of abuse or neglect. All right, and it can be anybody. It can be family members, caregivers, someone who just, neighbor who comes over and takes care of them, right? Because there is no family left or family in the area. All right, and it doesn't have to be always something you did. All right, a lot of times it can be something you didn't do. All right, and not you, like us personally, just like whoever their caregiver is, right? So a lot of times we don't really talk about it, right? A lot of times the elderly people themselves don't talk about it, all right? They don't either realize that it's happening to them or right, they're not gonna say they're okay with it, but they're afraid of speaking out because they may be abused more when they get home by the same person, all right? So it's definitely a traumatic event, okay? For whatever reason, it is usually older women above 70, 75, all right, and it can be monetary, it can be sexual. All right, I had one lady who said one of the aides in the nursing home kept touching her inappropriately while like cleaning her and her son pulled her out and he takes care of her at home now, All right? So I don't know, there, it was investigated. I have no idea what happened. I didn't follow up, but <clears throat> right, apparently it happened. It was in the city. She was in a nursing home down somewhere in the city. Okay. And then sometimes, right, people who have been abused their whole lives turn into abusers as like a coping mechanism or for whatever reason. All right. So what's our job? What are we supposed to do about it? Okay. Why are we there in the first place? Who called? All right. Did the abuser call? Did grandma finally get a hold of the phone and make a call for herself? Right. What happened? Okay. Take note of the environment. Like I said, the condition that the patient lives in, if they have home health care and their house still looks like a hoarder and still has garbage packed up everywhere and still has diapers on the floor and right, whatever, like that's, that's not okay. All right. That's still that home health care person is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. All right. Are there any soft tissue injuries, right? Like children, like abuse injuries. Okay. Are there any of those um, ulcers that we talked about? saw pictures of, okay. Um, is nobody really giving you any answers to your questions, right? Are you not getting the answers you're looking for, for whatever reason, okay? Does the home healthcare not know, don't know, doesn't understand, doesn't wanna tell you anything, all right? Or like I've always said, right? Are there two stories and they're not matching, all right? Which one, which one is right, okay? So, we got to put our put our super sleuth hats on and kind of try to figure something out. Okay, like I said, most of these you're going to notice over time. You're not going to get on the first one, okay? Because you're going to walk in, you're going to treat the patient. You may look around a couple of times, but you're not going to really, unless you have a good spidey sense, get that tingle yet. Okay, so good things to look for are: is the caregiver concerned? right, about the safety of the, of the older person, or are they just like, yeah, whatever, she's gotta go, right? They've been, they've been bothering me, I'm going out. I told you about the one where the, the wife called, had mom taken to the hospital because her and her husband were going out for the evening and like no one was gonna be home. So she was like, oh yeah, like her, her, she's just altered. She's not acting right, she's gotta go be evaluated. And then she looked at her husband and was like, hurry up, we got like three hours before she's back. Right, she was just getting sent to the hospital so they could go out. All right, again, when you call them out, are they getting really defensive, right? Do they know that you know, and now they're like trying to backpedal, okay? Will the caregiver answer every question, all right? Do you have to be like, I didn't ask you, I asked you, right? Like, let her answer, let him answer. Like, I get it, you understand, I need to find out if they understand, right? Play it off be like, no, I'm just trying to assess like 
her mental status. There's a couple of questions I have to ask her. Like if you could let me let her answer for me so I can I can understand what's going on. All right. Try to play it off like you're just trying to do your job. Okay. How many times are you at this specific address? Or, you know, like most times when you see the person who relieved you or you relieve them, you're like, oh yeah, I went to this address again three times yesterday. This is what we did. Oh, cool. I was there two days a day, two times a day before. Like, and then you end up going like two or three times a day that you're working again. Right. So keep track of that kind of stuff. Right. The old accident prone, right? Or the this injury does not match this explanation. Right. There's no way this person got that type of injury. All right. <clears throat> Are they psychosomatic complaints? Is it someone who has chronic pain without any explanation for it? Are they self-destructive, right? Are they depression? Are they abusing substances? Okay, all these types of things, right? Are they going to the, to the hospital for pain management and then the person's taking the pain pills at home and taking them themselves, right? Instead of the, per the, the elderly person, who knows, all right? So. These are the type of elder abuse that, that can happen. All right, we have physical abuse, which can be everything from assault all the way down to just not maintaining the house or themselves, right? We have psychological, which can be verbal, um, right? Treating them as infants and not giving them that respect of being an elderly person, but like, you know, treating them like you would treat your kids, yelling at them all the time complete neglect and just forgetting that they're there and just letting them do whatever they want to do and who cares, right? Or is it financial? Are they taking things, right? Are they trying to take over their bank accounts? Are they trying to get access to their money? Are they taking things out of the house, right? Taking jewelry, stuff like that, all right? All of it's part of it, all right? So what are we looking for? Oh, we're looking for the same thing we look for in children, okay? We're looking for bruising, especially in a physical setting. All right, looking for biting, okay? And it may not be biting on the patient, it may be biting on the caregiver. And why are we, why are we looking at biting bites on the caregiver, right? Because that's the only way the old person can defend themselves is when they put their hand near them, they bite them, all right? So if they go, oh, watch it, she's a biter. Well, is she, is she a biter or is she biting you because you're abusing her and that's herself defending herself, right? So again, right? All of these things, right? Cigarette burns, match burns, chemical burns, right? Forced immersion, people are sick. It really drives me crazy, all right? Lack of hygiene, have they given up on themselves, right? Because the people around them gave up on them, okay? Do they not take care of themselves and not shower? Do they not shave, right? They're not eating, they're not, brushing their teeth, right? Not combing their hair, okay? You go in the house and like you, the stove hasn't been used in forever. The water hasn't been used in forever. Like there's plastic bags piled up everywhere, just trash, okay? What's going on, right? <clears throat> and then again, we're not gonna look, okay? At the genitals or the rectum, obviously, unless we have a reason to. All right, but don't don't forget those are options even in old people. All right, sometimes it happens. I can't speak of an incident that's happened locally, but it does apparently happen. All right, any questions on geriatrics? Everybody good? Somewhat good? Like I said, most of this stuff is all review. The treatments and everything are the same. It's just kind of stuff to look for. All right. You guys want a couple of minutes or you want to keep rolling right through? Anybody? Nope, I'll take your quietness as we're gonna keep going. All right, special challenges. What are special challenges? Let's see if we can do the whole lecture without having to move a slide. No, we can't do that, but see how far we can get. What are special challenges? Yeah. 
Disabilities, what kind? You have, to, you have to yell at me, I'm sorry. Developmental. developmental disabilities, yep. So what what type of developmental disabilities are out there? Which are, what are the ones that we're worried about? Hmm? Autism. Autism's one, it's becoming more prevalent now that we have, understand what it is, right? What else? Asperger's, right? that's part of that. Okay, what else? Down syndrome is a good one, right? What else? What other kind of disabilities? OCD could be one, right? How do we how do we deal with someone who has OCD? Hmm. Right, they can get really overstimulated. What about the people OCD who have certain right virtuals? It's almost ritualistic, right? They can't leave the house unless they touch every doorknob or like whatever their ritual is, like, are you just gonna force them out of the house or are you gonna let them do their ritual to get out of the house, right? Depending on whether they're physically able to perform it, right? But, right, we, so we have to kind of work within that, all right? What other kind of special considerations are out there? Cerebral palsy, yeah. What else? What other kind of special circumstances do you think you might run into? Bigger people? Height and weight, yeah. Imagine if I just laid on the ground and acted dead and you guys had to lift me up, okay? Also, it, things that are, also things that are physical too, right? Like more like um, congenital or like- Right, there's physical defects, right? Congenital defects, okay. What else? What um, kind of equipment might we see out there that we're not- comfortable or or used to seeing on normal patients maybe a wheelchair wheelchairs okay colostomy bags trachs right what goes along with the trach sometimes the oxygen tank what else pacemakers are more um more benign a little bit okay there's the there's the defibrillator vests. No, no, I know what he's talking about. Let's see if anybody knows. It has to deal with the heart. We talked about it in cardiology, right? The battery is outside. It's a complete um, bypass of the left ventricle. The LVADs, okay. LVADs are a special concern. Let's go back to the trach though. What, what goes along with trach sometimes? Hmm? Right, what machine? Well, their suction machine. What, what machine specifically? Well, vocalizers, okay, for people that have those. Nope, what, what, kind, of, what kind of airway machine that goes along with oxygen that can also be seen with trachs? Has a lot, a bunch of hoses to it, a lot of bells, a lot of dinging. No, ventilators, right? A lot of people, uh, trachs, some people have home ventilators. All right, you may have to take with you, okay? Usually someone in the family is, is trained on how to use the ventilator, all right? And you bring that person with you and you bring the ventilator with you and you let them handle the ventilator, all right? And you just, you transport the patient. Okay, if you, if you feel more comfortable calling ALS, absolutely call because we can handle the ventilator as well. But as long as there is someone trained to handle the ventilator at home, you, they can handle it for you and you can take that patient by yourself if you're comfortable dealing with it. All right, so good, we got a good handle on it. All right, so let's kind of go through some of these, right? So we talked about developmental ones. Okay, what about intellectual disabilities? What are we gonna do? We didn't really talk about intellectual ones. We talked about other stuff. All right, what are we gonna do for cognitively impaired people?
right try to speak to them at their level without patronizing them okay and that's kind of a hard line right because you don't want to belittle them in front of the family right and you don't want to speak down to them in front of the family but you also need to establish that rapport and that trust right with that with that individual in their capacity to understand it right then you know understand why you're there what you're there to do okay what you're going to do all right and everything like that good okay so again all these different things we're not going to go through the causes of them right but just remember both of them are genetic and congenital okay possibly the traumatic brain injury if they if something happened to them all right again family members are usually in all of these all right when you do your histories for every one of these your family members are usually going to be your best okay if they're in a facility they've always got a book and there's usually a transport book that goes with them that has all of their history information diagnoses everything you need to know all right they usually have their routines all right this is what i talked about like the routines or their rituals like let them let them work within that okay the best that you can all right and just because they're disabled doesn't mean they have any different immune immunizations to things right they're just as susceptible to everybody else all right, so we talked about autism. Now, what's the problem with autism? I mean, there's not a problem. What's the challenge with autism and, and EMS? Hmm? Verbal communication. Okay. What else? What's the most prevalent thing about autism? Right? What's their, what are they? lack social skills right they're not very interactive they don't they don't really interact with people very well they don't know how they don't understand the concept right it's it's like a foreign thing to them all right so you got to kind of do the best you can right especially within that repetitive behavior okay if you can find an interest or activity that you know that they know that is your, that is your best way in you start talking to them about something that they like you got them all right and then you've gained that trust and they will usually comply with the things that you're trying to do all right sometimes all right they have abnormal responses okay sometimes right they laugh at inappropriate times again they don't understand those social cues right they don't know how to process certain emotions okay so they may have abnormal responses to what you think all right or they're hypersensitive to certain things, right? They're hypersensitive to noises, visual stimulation, right? They can get over, overstimulated real quick, which can send them off, okay? And they can get aggressive or non-cooperative. What? They can get self-injurious real quick, yeah. Yep, okay. So again, comfort them, right? Short, simple trust phrases okay way to get in find a way in and then give yourself time right if it's not a right now sort of thing right if they're not dying basically right take all the time you need all right it's not it's more about patient and your safety with these people okay and i'm not just talking about autism i'm talking about the whole chapter all right this is a whole chapter of patient safety and your safety all right that will serve you well through all of these okay down syndrome, again, we talked about, right? What is the, uh... crap, now I'm gonna forget. What is the, what is the, what is the genetic trait? Right, trisomy 21, okay. All right, so there's actually like three chromosomes on one, all right, which causes the genetic defect for Down syndrome. All right, and depending, all right, it depends on that level of impairment. All right, you'll see them from good to bad, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what, uh, how to explain it, but like the differences, right? The different levels. Okay. But standard visual discrepancies, right? That round head with the flat in the back, right? A larger 
tongue. Okay, so what are, what does that tell us right away about Down syndrome? Airway management, right? They got a larger tongue than most. Okay, so now we're worried about airway for those patients, right? Good. Okay, they got the the wider eyes. All right. Um, because of their genital defects, right? They're at a higher risk for things like leukemia and congenital heart disease. All right. Again, you don't have to worry about too much about intubation because of the larger tongues. However, we did talk about, right? The mass ventilation, getting that seal can be a lot harder. Getting an airway in can be a lot harder. Okay. So these ones, the jaw thrust or the nasal airways are a lot easier. Yep. 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 Yeah. So you don't want to just like throw the jaw out there. You just kind of do a little push. Yes. If they fall, right. We suspect head injury quite quickly. All right. We could put them in a, in a, uh, Right, is this the word you were trying to talk? The atlantoaxial joint, right? We were getting there. He got he got there ahead of us. Okay, but all right, seizures are the same. But yes, when they fall or any type of trauma, okay, we're always worried about that neck joint. All right, it's a small percentage of Down syndrome patients that have that problem. It's only about fifteen percent. All right, but again, we always are. This is this is your your C spine consideration patient. Right, if you have any any sort of C-spine consideration and you can get them to wear a collar, right? Try to put it on them, okay? And I'm not saying that as try, I'm like, try to get them, find a way, right? Because you, you'll be protecting yourself and them, all right? So this is pretty much exactly what we're gonna do for, like I said, every patient in this category, in this chapter, all right? Again, calm, friendly, rapport right i can't stress that enough all right the nicer you are to people the nicer they are back especially when they're having a bad day all right i know a lot of times when we're hurt and sick we don't really want to joke around but if you can get them to laugh at something stupid all right it is your best way in okay introduce everybody all right always explain and this should be for everybody all right but specifically in this chapter these people all right explain what you're going to do all right, no rushing around, okay? Don't, don't get them outside of their comfort zone, all right? And if you wanna be at eye level with the patient, but maintain eye contact, all right? I'm not getting on the floor anymore, unless I absolutely have to, <laughs> all right? But, okay, so we'll talk about brain injuries. Again, TBIs, all right? Um, you might deal with this more than everybody else because of the brain center in Kingston being over in that area. If you're responding, I don't know if you're in that area or not. And I keep, forget, I always forget what the name of that place is, but the Northeast center. Thank you. Right. Um, right. There's specialty places that handle it. Okay. Again, if they're at home, right. Cause they don't want to family wants them at home and they can take care of it. They can manage it. That's fine. All right. But again, go through the family, go, through the patient, try to figure out what's best, what's normal. All right, these people deal with this patient 24 hours a day, right? They are not self-sufficient, okay? So they are hyper attuned and fixated on that patient. All right, so when the smallest thing goes off, they're probably right. All right, if you come in and they say they're not acting this way or they're, they're acting, they're a little off. And I know it sounds weird, but the last time this happened, like I waited an extra day and they went in and they were sick and they were in the hospital for two weeks. So this time I'm going early, go, okay, cool. Right, because they know that their progression of whatever disease process, right, they, they understand it, all right? So the family will be your best friends, okay? And get them involved, all right? Explain what you're doing, reassess the patient, have the family member calm the patient down if you have to, okay? 
get the family involved with the care that you're doing because that helps because they are like i said they're hyper fixated on caring for this patient and they will they will watch everything you are doing okay visual impairment again blind people right are we gonna do anything different for these people than what we're gonna do for geriatrics for anything else right we talked about vision impairment right it doesn't really change too much all right this type of visual impairment can be congenital all right could be disease related okay it could be injury or it could just be neural right so depending on what it is and where it is and what kind of uh degeneration they have all right they may lose complete peripheral vision right but they can see you straight on so coming at them from the side is not a great idea right and always ask you can always ask like what the problem is or they'll let you know all right sometimes they may not lose here or they lose here but they can see you out here so stand off to the side a little bit right whatever you have to do to make your patient comfortable all right and you might just be a dark shape in front of them that, that might they might be all they can see now okay so just again what do we do all right reinforcement what do we do for blind people if all they if all they see is a big dark shape lumbering towards them right right a lot of verbal be very verbal be very expl explicative i guess um right and slow slow deliberate movements right nothing too rapid nothing too fast okay just talked about it. make yourself known right introduce yourself if there's any visual aids like if they have glasses or whatever it is that they use or they need or whatever kind of interaction that they've developed their system right use it okay make them feel comfortable all right describe what happened right because they may know something happened but they may not know what it is right so describe it to them tell them what happened to them all right again take canes walkers i try not to leave or i try not to use because hospitals have walkers wheelchairs i really try not to take because while well, hospitals have them service animals you're more than welcome to take all right or if you can make arrangements for them all right but we don't just take johnny's dog because Johnny has nowhere to go. Like it has to be a service dog or a service animal, right? And again, all right, we're not gonna pull, push, right? If they're if you're helping them, assisting them to the stretcher, walking, like we're we're guiding, but we're not like shoving. All right, I've seen people like you're not going fast enough and like try to help them. All right, we don't do any of that. Okay. And give them a heads up, <laughs> right? Like don't tell them the obstacles in front of them when it gets there. Be like, hey, in a couple of feet, like we're gonna go down a step. All right, and they'll be like, okay, just let me know when, right? Just be be normal, I guess. I don't know. All right, hearing people. Again, what are we gonna do for hearing people? All right, hearing challenge. What do we do? Hmm. Sure, either one. Pick one. What do we do? Gestures. What else? What else can we do? Write stuff down. There is a strong possibility if you were born with a hearing defect, like they know sign language, their family knows sign language, right? If there's a family member there that knows sign language and they can communicate and you can communicate between them, I do it all the time, especially with foreign languages. There's a family member that speaks English. I'm like, can you can you help me translate? And they're like, sure. Right? Use whatever resource you have. Okay. You can talk to the, the mother and the mother can sign to the patient. And the patient can sign back to the mother. That's a beautiful thing, right? That's perfect, perfect communication. Or if they can read your lips and then they can, right? They can still speak sometimes. Right. Sometimes they speak and sign. All right. So do whatever their whatever their system is, right? Okay, so hearing aids, right? Give them the hearing aid, help them put the hearing aid in. Don't jam your finger down the rear, but you know what I mean? Like give it to them if they can't put it in, kind of put it in, let them gently push it in, all right? Make sure it's just snug and secure in the ear canal, all right? 
<clears throat> again, if you walk in and they're completely ignoring you, it may not be because they're altered. It just might be they don't have their hearing aid in or turned up, right? So try to get their attention, assess that kind of stuff. All right. So again, right? We just talked about all that stuff, okay? Don't speak louder, go lower, right? It's not a volume, it's a tone, okay? My grandfather's this way because he was an airplane mechanic in the Air Force for however many years, and he can't hear high-pitched tones and barely hear my mother. He hears me and my dad perfectly fine. Can't hear my mother. Always ask her to repeat herself. I don't know if he's playing a game, if he's just joking around, because he's like that, right? But medically, it's because we think it's the tone, all right? Again, sign language, right? There's someone there who can interpret if you know sign language, okay? There's people out there that know it, that take it. High school, I think, offers it nowadays. It's just, right? So if that's something you were interested in, you did, okay? You may be, you may have an extra skill, all right? That helps you out. Paper and pencil is my favorite. I can write a question down, hand it to them. They write the answer, hand it back, okay? That's direct communication. I don't even need a translator for that one, right? That is directly between me and them. I'll get the, the straightest story I'm going to get, right? Okay? Only one person. This is true for every, every senior on, all right, no matter who it is, but especially in this situation, okay? Only one person asking questions at a time. Don't barrage them with questions, okay? And I will do this with my partners, right? I will sit back and I will let them do their assessments, right? We we're talking about this earlier, okay, until my EMT determines that it is no longer BLS and they want help and then I'll step in, all right? But if they're going down a line of questions, okay? And there's a question in that line that they didn't ask and they jump over it, I'll be like, excuse me, right? And I'll ask that, that third question in the line, whatever it is, okay? Just in case it does turn, then I don't have to ask them that question again, all right? And we're already in, in that line of questioning, in that mode, in that thought process for the patient, okay? And then hopefully that reiterates with my EMT that, we should be thinking about this as well when you're asking those questions, all right? So one person, and then you can always use the reverse stethoscope technique. I don't really know if I, I like it, but you can use the stethoscope as a hearing aid. You put it in their ears and you're talking the bell. All right, just be careful because try it on yourself first one time, okay? <laughs> all right, <clears throat> common terms for sign language. All right, A is sick, B is hurt, C is help. All right, learn basic, simple kind of terms, right? Are you sick? Are you hurt? Do you need help? Okay, hearing aids we talked about. All right, if you hear whistling, right? If you can hear that feedback, it's not positioned properly in the ear. All right, or it's turned up or it's catching feedback from something else. All right, so ask them because they may not hear it. All right, and these are some common, common types of hearing aids. Um, e, right, is the one that we're seeing most often these days that completely hidden inside the ear canal. A, you see mostly on children. B, we don't really see very often at all anymore, ones that have like external battery packs to them. Um, C and D, all right, kind of different versions of C, D, and E, all right, depending on the manufacturers, okay? But again, if you see them laying around, grab them. They usually have a little plastic box that they keep them in, all right? Either put them in the box, take them with you to the hospital, put them in the ear, all right, do something. All right, cerebral palsy we talked about a little bit in the beginning, right? So... Poorly controlled body movement. All right, so some sort of in utero brain development, right? Some sort of hypoxic event, either while developing or in birth. Okay, sometimes this can happen during birth. All right, a TBI or possibly meningitis, right? During the first couple formative years. All right, can really leave some lasting effects right, on that neuro tissue. All right, so this is kind of like your, um, I don't wanna say standard 
right presentation of, of cerebral palsy, but this is like the, I don't even want to use generic, right? There's like no, no, no good term for it, but um, most common, how about that? That's the most common presentation, okay? So they have that poor posture, right? They can't, don't really have very good muscle control, right? Some sort of visual hearing combination, all right? May or may not be able to con communicate very well, all right? Our dispatcher is like this, okay? So he comes in, we made a, a parking space just for him, right? Because we didn't have any handicapped parking at the station. So we had to make him a parking spot, which we did. All right, he drives himself to work. He gets out he's got his walker. He walks in. We all kind of, every one of us stands at the door waiting to run out to catch him. I swear to God, I don't know if it's an instinct. I don't know if it's that big brother care instinct, but he makes it in every day. But every day he walks, it's like, whew, we all get nervous. All right, it is, but he's good. All right, it takes him a little bit longer to dispatch stuff. All right, you kind of just got to sit there and wait an extra 10, 15, 20 seconds for him to get it out, but he does a great job, All right? So again, airway, okay, is what we're usually worried about. There's not always an intellectual disability with cerebral palsy, all right? It's mostly motor function, okay? Um, they are more prone, again, to injury and or falls, right? Because just the underdevelopedness of the body and, and how they end up having to walk. And, okay, so, and again, they may have special wheelchairs, right? So just be, be aware of all that and you're more than likely not gonna get the wheelchair inside the ambulance. They're, they're like, they have some pretty intense wheelchairs, uh, but take the pillow if they have special pillows, all right, that help them out. Try to try to do whatever we can do for them, okay? Um, pad all the voids, especially if they're sitting kind of weird on your stretcher. Um, let, the, let the legs fall however they fall, all right? When you lift them up and you put them on, they're either gonna readjust themselves into a position of comfort or you just let them fall the way they fall, but don't try to position them where you want them, okay? And then there has been known to be seizures involved. All right, so just be aware for it. It's not gonna be a thing. It's not always gonna happen, okay? But it's a possibility, so. This one we kind of talked about during neonatal. This is spina bifida, right? I told you I would talk to you about this one, okay? This is where um, it's an incomplete closure of the spinal column, so it's outside the body, right? in a nice little sack, okay? They can repair it, but it usually leaves some sort of residual spinal damage. All right, so you may or may not see that when delivering a baby. All right, what do we do if we do? Yep, yep, sterile moist dressing and wrap it, protect it, All right? Good. Okay, what's hydrocephalus? Fluid on the brain, excess fluid on the brain. Okay, so I, I had pictures for this one, but I didn't put them in this time for shunting because my last class really asked me what shunting was. So what they do is they take basically a, a plastic port and they put it where the fluid accumulates and they drain it down, farther down into the body or externally. All right, and it's a pretty severe surgery. And I will find some pictures here in a minute for you to show you different types of shunts, okay? Um, again, it's just something you have to be more careful of and be more in tune, like when dealing with that patient's head all right, there may or may not be partial or full paralysis, okay? They may have bladder control. Usually these people end up having latex allergies. I don't know what spina bifida and latex has in common, all right? But for whatever reason, they are more prone to latex allergies. So I don't think we have to worry about that too much anymore, but I always just add it, all right? Because I don't know what everyone uses for gloves, but just be aware, okay? 
paralyzed people. We didn't we didn't get this one in the beginning. What do paralyzed people require? Transport, yeah, but what <laughs> what what are they gonna what do they require for us? Motility, right? Are these people getting up and gonna walk to the stretcher for you? No. Huh? What? Um, I mean, you, you'd, you'd be surprised how many times we make people walk instead of getting the stair chair and carrying them out. If they, if they can walk and it's safer, okay, especially in some of the environments that you go into, it's if they can walk themselves out instead of being carried out and it's safer for everybody, okay? Um, a lot of times, again, if you come to pick me up and no offense, if it's Lucy and Isabel and I feel like I can walk myself out, I'm gonna walk myself out because I do not want them to have to strain themselves to try to carry me outside of the house. They might both be more than capable of doing it. All right, but I, <laughs> I will probably crawl out of the house and try to help them as much as I can. All right, so, right, there are, I mean, everybody tried to lift the dummy. I watched everyone lift it. I know who can lift the dummy and I know who can't, okay? So, again, I'm just saying, right, it is what it is, okay? So, <clears throat> what do we have to worry about with, with paralyzed people as far as assessments? What do we concern ourselves with? Blood clots, DVTs, right? Okay, what else? Breathing. Breathing, right? There could be something wrong. They're sedentary, right? They're not getting up and they're moving around. Okay, so they have a lot of those sedentary bedridden problems that we talked about, right? Like what? Pneumonia, ulcers, pressure sores, wounds, infections. Okay, all that good stuff, right? Okay. They may or may not need a ventilator. All right, what else? What are these things? All right. What are the, what, you guys read the chapters. I know there's pictures of every one of these things in the chapters, right? What are they? What's a urinary catheter? It catches urine in a little bag, right? The tube that they put up your urethra, right? Some people can change their own. Okay, some people require having to go to the hospital depending what type of catheters they are that they're using. All right, so let's say, right? What are what are you what can you find in in a in a catheter bag? You can find blood, right? Hopefully, you're gonna find urine. Okay, okay. Does that does that catheter bag now become part of your assessment? Are you going to look at it? Are you going to see how much is in it? What color it is, right? I'm not asking you to open it up and smell it, okay? But look at it, right? Is there? Is it red? Is it orange? Is it brown? Is it rust colored, okay? Is, the, is it empty, right? Is it full, right? Is the, it's got a thousand mLs in it? And like, when was the last time it was emptied? Is the urine backing up into the tube because it's got nowhere to go in the bag, all right? Is it cloudy? Are there actually like congealed things in the, mm, yeah, you look at me like this and let me tell you some things I've seen in catheters, okay? I can, I can look at the catheter, I can look at the tube and I can know that you have a UTI without, uh, without anything else, all right? I can, I'll, they're altered, I will look at the UTI, I will look at the bag and I'll be like, UTI, let's go, we're done. Or sepsis, one or the other, okay? But there will be, pillowy, like cloudy, congealed. What are those things called? Do you know? Sediment. Yeah. It's weird sediment. That's usually indicative of like a UTI or something, but like, it's, it's a thing of its own. Okay. We've talked about trach tubes, colostomy tube. What's a colostomy bag? What is a colostomy? Okay, 
doesn't necessarily have to be born, all right? They can have colon cancer and have 18 feet of their colon taken out and now have a colostomy bag for the rest of their life, okay? There's, all right, so what are we worried about colostomy bags? What do you think we're, we're worried about when we deal with those? Yeah. Hmm? Sealing the bag properly, right? Sometimes it might leak and that's a little gross, but that's not, that's not a horrible thing, right? But what else? Infection. Infection around the opening site, okay? That's, that's a solid thing we're worried about, right? So we're, we shouldn't take the bag off, but we can look through, they're usually clear, all right? So you can look through the bag, okay? And see if there's no red irritating, if you can sit, look around the opening and it's red irritated, pussy, like looks infected, right? Okay, feeding tubes. Right? Do we all, they may know types of feeding tubes other than Mark? What types of feeding tubes are out there? All right? There's a whole bunch. Okay. And it all depends on where they're going. All right. And all we're worried about is if, are they in place? Are they bleeding from it? Okay. Is it infected? Right? Did it get dislodged? Did they pull it by accident? Not by accident. Right? So, again, all of those people, all right have healthcare providers there usually 24 seven and we'll be able to tell you kind of what's going on and what the problem is and why, why you were called. All right. So, but just be, be aware of those different things and be able to use those things as part of your assessment tools. Okay. They may have problems swallowing depending on where the level of paralysis is, right? So you may have to suction. Okay. And then figure out, all right. Again, like I've said before, include them in decisions. All right, these people get moved on a daily basis, right? Because they can't move themselves. Is there a Hoyer lift, right? Do we even have to lift this patient? Do they have a pad underneath them that we can put on a crane that lifts them up? We can slide them over, put them on the stretcher and lift them down. All right, those are my favorite patients because I don't have to do a darn thing, right? I don't have to lift them. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to hurt myself, okay? So find out the best way to move them before we worry about it. All right, yay fat people like me, okay? Obese people, I'm obese, come on. You can all laugh about it, I'll laugh about it. I am definitely 30% over my ideal body weight. I am six foot tall, I should be 180 pounds and I am well over that. And I am perfectly okay with it, all right? But <clears throat> we still gotta talk about it, all right? So obviously, right, these are heavy people, okay? Two to three times over their ideal body weight, obviously some sort of imbalance between what they consume versus what they burn, right? Otherwise they'd be skinny, okay? Can be attributed to, right? My metabolism is, is bad. All right, maybe it is. Let's not blame it all on your metabolism. All right, I just looked in the fridge and let me tell you, there's not a green thing in there. So I don't know if I believe the metabolism story, but all right, okay, whatever. Could be genetic. Could be could be psychological, right? A lot of people's comfort is food. Okay, it's one lady that we took care of out in Dover. Her son takes her to the doctor and buys her KFC every time on the way home. Not supposed to have it, right? She he even says he's like, I hate doing it, but she won't shut up unless I buy her some. So I get every time, right? Just for his peace of mind. Okay, so it might be psychological. All right, possibility of your quality of life is negatively affected. All right, luckily my quality of life is the same. So I'm not, that's why I really don't get upset about being overweight yet. All right, luckily I apparently have good genetics. And I don't have any of that stuff yet. All right, I gotta really start paying attention, but all right. Obviously mobility for a reason, right? Diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, right? Stroke, all that good stuff, plaque embolisms. All right, so how do we deal with, with heavy people? All right, what do we do? Okay, we plan, we plan ahead, right? They're gonna be embarrassed, right? Cause they're large. And now, like I said, I'm gonna pick on these two cause they're the smallest ones here, but Lucy and, and Isabel are the crew and they walk in and I look at them and I'm like, yeah, right, right. Okay, I'm already upset because these two skinny girls have to try to lift my big old butt up off the floor and take me to the hospital, right? So I'm already embarrassed, okay? 
So now, now what do we got to do? What, all right, what do you guys want to do? Let's walk this one through. You, you come in, you find me laying on the floor and I can't help you. Call someone, who are you going to call? Fire department. fire department, okay. So when the fire department gets there, what do you do? So, so Joe, and, Joe and Patrick here show up. All right, that's all you got. They were the, they were the only ones. It's, it's two o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday or on a, on a Wednesday. Everybody, all the volunteers are at work. All right, these two guys had the day off. They were like, eh, let's go see what's happening. All right, so now you got, you got the four of you, okay? Now what do you wanna do? Just so you know, in real life, I live on a second story. Um, the only entrance to my house is on the second story and there's three flights of steps on a wooden deck that go zing, zing, zing. And you can make like a 90 degree turn around each one. Huh? Stair chair? Possibly. Am I alert and oriented? I'd roll myself, but that's, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, no, I'm not getting up. Let's just say I'm unconscious. We'll make it, we'll make it super easy, super hard. Right. Huh? I'm unconscious. I have no muscle tone. I'm unconscious. You want to put me in a stair chair? That that's called a Reeves. Yes, you can absolutely do that. Okay. Who do you want on the bottom? Who do you want on the top? A sheet well you do want a sheet on the on the reeves yes but i meant personnel wise yeah i would put joe and patrick on the bottom right sure okay i mean you could hmm that they're there to catch me that's that's the why you put them there if you let go they're supposed to stop me from rolling down the steps okay However, I will give you this one better. Okay. How are you, how is your back going to feel bending over trying to lower me down the steps when you're going down the steps like this, trying to one step at a time, right? They're easy. They're at the bottom going, you guys. Okay. Right. Walking backward. I don't, I'd have someone spotting me walking backwards. Huh? It's still not going to feel it. Take a break, right? Go one flight of steps, take a break if you have to, right? You don't have to, okay? You don't have to get me all the way down in one shot, all right? If you got to walk 10 feet and take a break, walk 10 feet, take a break, okay? Like I said, I have back injuries. I, my partner now knows, like, if I give him a certain look, like, he's like, do you want to stop? I go, mm-hmm, right? Because my back is starting to spasm, all right? And I'm not going to drop him. Okay, so as long as we're not in the middle of the stairs, okay, we take a we take a short second, couple minute break, and, or we'll swap. He'll come up and grab the head. I'm still stubborn. I'm bigger than he is, so I like to grab the head because it's heavier instead of taking the feet, right? So maybe we swap and he grabs the head and I grab the feet, right? So you do what you got to do, but make a plan, right? Make a plan, execute the plan, okay? Hmm? Right, know the plan's gonna go off the rails and make another plan. Okay, so maintain the dignity and respect. All right, don't sit there and be laughing and making jokes while you're trying to lift my fat ass down the steps. All right. Well, hearing is the last thing to go, so I may still hear you, I just may not be able to tell you I can hear you, right? So whatever, all right, if I'm awake, right? How have they done it before? Well, the last time the fire department came and they had to put me on the blue tarp and they dragged me down, okay. Then, you know, when you get to the 700 pound stage, we're cutting holes and we're cutting the wall out of your house out and we get a crane and we pull you out. Okay. <laughs> well, the fire department went out and got like nine foot straps that uh, we would wrap her around in like a burrito in her own mattress. And then we would carry her mattress out to the truck. Yeah. And then we would load, we would fold the mattress and we would load the mattress into the back of the big box style ambulance. And she would go to the hospital on her queen size mattress. That's how we got her out. And we would use both stretchers like to wheel outside into her house. Hmm. Yeah, it was not fun. 
we called the fire department every time and they complained. And I was like, but you know, you guys know, like how are we supposed to do this by ourselves? Like, there's no way, right? So it took all of 15 to 20 people, right? To get this lady out of her house on, on any given day. And it took the same 15 to 20 people to get her back into her house when we brought her back from the hospital, okay? And inside the hospital, we had to let them know who was coming because in order to effectively treat this woman, they had to put two hospital beds together, okay? And like literally she almost sat in the crack of the two and like her two lymphedemas hung on each side of the bed because she had one on each side. So we had to, they had to find two beds for her, all right? Oh yeah, we were. Mm, mm, mm. We had that happen. Like I was this tight because one she ruptured the underside of one of her lymphedema sacs, which are highly vascular, and she was there was already a pool the size of Bridget on the floor, and she was still bleeding. And there, there, I mean, there were whole like blankets that we were using trying to put pressure instead of like abdominal pads. We were using blankets. That day was probably about 20 minutes because there was no. <clears throat> well, because it was. You do the best you can on scene with what you have and like you manage her. I would have had to manage her in the house until we got found a way to get her out. Luckily that day we were good. But yes, if she, I mean, she was bleeding out literally in front of us. And luckily, because it was a priority one and it sounded horrible, a, a bunch of people showed up that day. And yeah, you really have to hope for that. Yep. No, it was more over towards one of the elementary schools or off Sawkill Road in that general area, town of Ulster, I guess, more not Kingston, but I try to not break HIPAA by being as vague as possible in case people know, know who I'm talking about because certain people, people know more than, more than, especially if you're listening to the radio. Okay, I did hit record. So again, right, we have to worry about, about getting them out, right? So again, right, we're not lifting by one limb, okay? We're probably not lifting by any limbs, right? Sheets, blankets, mattresses, tarps, whatever you got to use, okay? We have bariatric movers. It's just a big fancy tarp with some reinforced stitching, all right? In the ambulance, we call them mega movers, all right? And communication, all right? That is your biggest, your biggest um, concern, all right? The one thing you should be focused on the most is your communication, all right? Because you don't want to get anybody injured you want to make sure everyone knows the plan. Everyone's okay with the plan. Everyone's okay with their assignment in the plan. All right. If you are given a task and you're like, hey, I know I can't do what you just asked, but make sure you tell somebody. All right. So you can get a new assignment. All right. Or like we said, if you're the only one left, right, manage, manage on the scene until you can safely get them out. All right. Again, right, like I talked about, okay, if you, like she said, what if I drop you? If you feel your hand slipping, let someone know like, hey, hey, I need to stop for a second. Like, I don't have a good grip. And tell them, I don't have a good grip. Don't you say I want to stop. Let everybody know why you need to stop, okay? So that we can all know. Don't just go like, oh, I told you, and like drop it, right? Because you're going to screw up everybody else. All right, so give everybody a heads up. Like, as soon as you feel it starting to slip, let people know. Don't go until you're absolutely about to let go right and then just oh I, got, I gotta go i gotta go okay make sure you're not pinching any part of the patient like when you strap them in all right make sure we're not causing any cuts damage bruising all right no pressure points okay and then again larger patients difficulty breathing 
All right, so once you do move, we try to move as fast as we can safely, right? Because we don't wanna cause a respiratory issue, all right? Or difficulty breathing, okay? So once you get them to where they're at, you probably will have to sit them back up again, all right? As the, the best way you can, all right? This is why outside the box kind of thinking, all right, is really, really what you need, all right? Again, if you have specialized equipment, all right, if you deal with the same patient every day, all right, and you have that ability or your unit has that ability, okay? Again, always plan your way out, all right? Make sure it's clear, make sure it's free of clutter so you don't fall, okay? Make sure you, there's nothing you have to lift over. You don't have to try to like lift up over something, okay? And then, like I said, notify, early so that they can be ready. All right, if they need stuff. All right, we got time to go through trach tubes and then we'll stop. Yeah, we got time to go through trach tubes. We've talked a lot about trach tubes. All right, tracheostomies, right? So we've talked about them. It's a little hole in the neck, right? It goes right down into the lungs. Okay, it's used for breathing. Usually some sort of reason, some sort of something happened up top, right? That allows or does not allow for proper ventilation the, the correct way, okay? So they can be temporary, they can be permanent, depending on the situation, all right? Like I talked about earlier, you know, we talked about the trachs, but you guys weren't sure about the ventilators, all right? Some of them have ventilators for the chronic, right? This the person that's gonna have a trach tube the rest of their life. They're just on a ventilator. The only way they're breathing is through that tube instead of being intubated the whole time, right? They rely on that ventilator, they need that ventilator, okay? So this is what they look like, all right? The only part that you can see, obviously, is this plastic part here that sticks out of the neck and the guard, all right? All of this stuff is, is internal, all right? Sometimes that balloon will get either deflated or dislodged, all right? And that might be causing secretions to come out from around it, okay? So a lot of times they do become clogged with secretions, all right? A lot of times they just need a good suction, okay? or they have some sort of infection. All right, so we have this mnemonic dope. All right, this one you might see again. I'm not too sure about the state test, but you might see it. All right, so this is what we go through. Basically, this is our checklist, right, of things when we're dealing with a trach. Was it displaced? Was, is it been dislodged for whatever reason? Or is it damaged? Okay, that's the first three things we look at. Then we look at, is it obstructed? Okay. Is there a structural problem? Do they have a pneumothorax, right? Did they fall? Did they, something happen, right? Whatever. Or is there just straight ventilator slash trach equipment failure? All right. Last worst case scenario. All right. So pay attention to that one. Okay. Um, again, bleeding or air leaking around the tube. Okay, sometimes, like I said, that balloon 